reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun. Heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Hello and welcome back to our study of the book of Acts. You'll remember last time we were together that we were looking at Acts chapter 21. Paul finally completed his journey all the way to Jerusalem. Of course, he had certain stops along the way. Everywhere he stopped, uh, the people heard about what the Holy Spirit was saying was going to happen in Jerusalem. They were upset by that. They begged him not to go. Uh, but he was intent on going because of the opportunity to speak to his brethren in the flesh, the Jews. And so then he arrived at Jerusalem. The, the church was glad to receive him, especially the elders. They rejoiced in the good news of what had been going on among the Gentiles. But then they said, you know, there's a rumor going around. And apparently it had reached the point where it wasn't just rumor in people's minds. It was a fact. And so they said... Uh, we want to demonstrate or you to demonstrate that you really are not opposed to, uh, to the law of Moses and to, to the Jewish people. And so they suggested that he go with four men, help them complete their vow, and that would demonstrate to all the believers, both uh, those Christians who understood about the law of Moses and those who didn't yet, they were still growing, they would now all understand uh, what the real case was with Paul. Well, Paul agreed to that, and he went with the men into the temple area. But some Jews from Asia stirred up the crowd, and boy, they really stirred it up. It became a, a violent mob, a lynch mob, uh, in effect. And this mob uh, drug Paul out uh, of the temple, and they began to beat him. I guess they would have beaten him to death had it not have been for the intervention of the Lord and I want to remind all of us that in Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul had asked the, the brethren at Rome to pray for him that God would deliver him. And I think this may well be an exact answer to prayer. We don't know that. It's not written down that it's that way. But it appears to me that this is an answer to those prayers, both of Paul and of the Roman Christians. So the commander, the Roman commander in the city, rushed out with certain centurions and soldiers, and they seized Paul, they got him away from the mob, and began to take him into the barracks. But you'll remember that we saw last time that Paul spoke to the commander and asked if he would be allowed to speak. So let's pick back up in Acts chapter 21, verse 37, and so that we remember and refresh our minds as to where we were. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying... Now, Hebrew here could be one of two things. It could literally be... Hebrew, or it could be Aramaic. But the point is, he spoke to the Jewish people in the language that they were very familiar with. He didn't speak to them in Greek. He spoke to them as brethren, just like you would expect him to. And his defense, his response to this angry mob, if you would, it begins in chapter 22, verse 1. Brethren and fathers... Hear my defense before you now. And the word defense there is apologia. And I only bring that up because later there are going to be Christian apologists 
who will come along in the late uh, uh, first century and really on into the second century. These men will defend the truth against false charges that are being leveled against it. And they were called apologists. Well, Paul is now making an apology. He's giving an answer, as it were, for, for the things of which he has been accused. So verse 2, And when they had heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. Boy, doesn't Paul know how to take even the worst situation and put the best possible uh, view of it before the people. He, he's not trying to incite this group. He's trying to have an opportunity to speak the truth to them. So he tells them the city in which he was born, Tarsus, that's what he'd already told the commander. But then he says, I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a student, a pupil, who was taught by Gamaliel, a famous Jew of that era. And he too was zealous for the law. And you know, you and I have seen that in the book of Acts. There's no doubt that in Acts chapter uh, 7 at the end, and then specifically in Acts chapter 8 at the beginning, in Acts chapter 9, we find Paul very violently dealing with the Christians. He too thought that he ought to oppose the way. And so he could honestly say, I, I was zealous for the law just like you are, uh, even at this moment. And notice, zealous for the law. Well, they were overzealous, if you would. They, were, they had become an angry mob. But nonetheless, that's the picture that he paints. In verse 4 of Acts 22, he continues, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Now notice he says, I persecuted this way. Very often in the book of Acts, especially in this latter uh, part of the book of Acts, the church is described as the way. And that's the exact wording that Paul uses <clears throat> before these Jews assembled on this occasion. He says, I too persecuted Christians. In other words, I persecuted the church, uh, just like in some ways you are trying to do even now. As also the high priest bears me witness in all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now, all of us who are familiar with this book of Acts in our study would know to go back now to Acts chapter 9 because this is the incident that Paul is relating. He received letters from the high priest and from the elders of the people. These letters were so that he could go to Damascus and if he found people pursuing the way, if he found Christians, they could be bound in chains and brought back to Jerusalem and punished for the false teaching that they were assumed to be doing. But verse 6, he says, Now it happened, as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Well, again, this is the exact record that Luke has already given us in Acts chapter 9. It's about noon when the great light shines. And I want us all to remember and think about what would it be like for a light brighter than the sun at noon to be shining down? That would impress you. And it certainly would demonstrate that whoever is talking to you is someone very, very powerful. And so that's why uh, the response of Paul was, Who are you, Lord? And now here's the answer that 
I don't think he dreaded to hear. I don't think he even conceived that he possibly would hear it. But he hears, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, you and I would say, wait a minute. How did he persecute Jesus of Nazareth? But the reality is that the church is the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, or Ephesians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23 demonstrate that very, very clearly. So when Jesus says, you've been persecuting me, he means you've been persecuting my body, the church. And that's, that's what now is laid out before Paul, and that's what he's relating. And he says, <clears throat> uh, he goes on to say, And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Now, some would say, well, this is a contradiction because in Acts chapter 9, it says they did hear. The point is, it seems to me, that they heard a sound, but they didn't hear what the voice was saying. They did not discern or differentiate the various words that were being delivered. And so there doesn't have to be a contradiction here. It's just a different way of viewing that same incident. And so verse 10, so I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Now, I think it's very important for us to see something here. Uh, the Apostle Paul, let's think about it. Paul was talking uh, to Jesus. So we have uh, Jesus speaking to Paul. And as Jesus speaks to Paul, Paul asks the question, what? What should I do? Now, obviously, we have a great opportunity here for the Lord to respond to that question personally. If ever there was an opportunity, if ever there was a chance for the Lord to directly deal with someone, this is it. But that's not the Lord's plan. The Lord's plan is for men to deliver the message. The Lord is now in heaven, and so with Him in heaven, He is not going to answer this, but instead He says, Go into the city, and in the city you will be told. Now who's going to tell Him? Well, we're going to see that in just a moment, and what we're going to observe is when He says you will be told, it's not going to be the Lord that tells him. Instead, it's going to be a man who's going to tell him because that's God's plan after all. God's plan is for men to deliver the gospel. So now let's go back to the text and look again at what, is, what, is, what Paul is relating to us. Arise, go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. So now listen, uh, did the Lord tell Paul what to do? Did he directly deal with him? Did the Holy Spirit tell Paul what to do? directly? And the answer to both of those questions is an obvious no. The Lord did not tell him directly. The Holy Spirit did not tell him directly. Instead, Jesus sent Ananias. Now Luke gave us more details about Ananias in Acts chapter 9. We know that the Lord came to him and told him to go speak to Paul. And we also know that Ananias was a bit hesitant because after all, he was well aware of what Paul had been doing and re really what his goal was when he came to Damascus. But it's Ananias that comes to him. And now we pick up uh, the testimony of Paul in verse 13 of Acts 22. Uh, Ananias came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will 
and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. Uh, the word know here is a word that literally conveys the idea of knowledge that comes about through an active relationship. <coughs> so Ananias is basically saying, Paul, you're going to get to actively know the Lord through an active relationship that you're going to have with the Lord. And boy, that's going to be so important. In the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul very clearly lays out that he did not learn the things he preached from men, but instead he learned it or learned them from the Lord. And so here is a clear indication of exactly what we're talking about. Ananias says you're going to get to know the Lord through an active relationship. Verse 15 then, For you will be His witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, let's go back to our board and let's see what we've been talking about here. He's asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord does not answer that directly. Instead, He says, go into the city and you'll be told what to do. Now think about this for just a minute. He's asking, what do I need to do to be saved? The Lord doesn't answer. But when Ananias comes, he does answer. And he says, arise, be baptized, and do what? Wash away your sins. Wash away your sins. Now, clearly, from the statement of Ananias, we can all reach a, a, a very important conclusion. Sins are only washed away when one is baptized. I know there are people out there that believe that they are saved when they accept Jesus as their personal Savior. Or maybe they pray the sinner's prayer. But Scripture does not confirm that position. Instead, Scripture suggests that in reality, we've got to be baptized in order to wash away our sins. Baptism is not an outward sign of an inward grace. Instead, baptism is, watch this, calling on the name of the Lord. And that's very important as well. Some people say, all oh, you folks that believe in water baptism, believe in a works salvation. <clears throat> baptism is a work you do to be saved. Actually, it is not. Baptism is an action that we take in which we call on the name of the Lord. We call on the Lord to cleanse us of our sins. That's consistent with what the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, when he says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Later translations don't have the word answer. Instead, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, and others say the appeal for. So baptism is my appeal, it's your appeal to God to cleanse us. On what basis? Well, Peter did not say on the basis of your own good works. Instead, he said on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that word resurrection, obviously, is a synecdoche. That is a part that stands for the whole. Uh, you really can't have a resurrection without a death and a burial. And so when he says, <clears throat> by the resurrection, he literally means by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, interestingly enough, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Paul relates the gospel that he delivered to them, you may remember what he says. That gospel was that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised again the third day according to 
the Scriptures. So in other words, baptism is my participation in the gospel, pleading with God for a clean conscience. It's something that even Saul of Tarsus had to do, and certainly it is what we need to do. Now, verse 17 of Acts 22, Paul continues, Now, it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. In other words, the Lord is saying, Paul, they're not going to listen to you talking about Jesus. Not right now. They're not going to hear your testimony about the Christ. And so get out of the city before they do harm to you. So verse 19. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. <clears throat> then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Who decided <clears throat> where Paul would go and to whom he would preach? Well, it wasn't Paul. It was the Lord. But as you can imagine, a Jewish mob who's already riled up, riled up about thinking that Paul has brought a Gentile into the temple, you can just about imagine their response. In verse 22, Luke reports it. <clears throat> and they listened to him until this word. When, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth for he is not fit to live. This is the reason that they plan to kill him because he said the gospel is to be delivered to the Gentiles. They consider themselves to be God's chosen people. <coughs> the Gentiles are lost in their view. They are not chosen by God. They do not have a right to hear words of salvation. And that's what riles them up on this occasion. So verse 23, Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. Now remember, Paul's been speaking in the Hebrew tongue. And so I suppose that this Roman commander does not know what he said. That's why he needs, he needs to find out. And so his plan is basically to beat it out of him, to interrogate him uh, through means of a beating. And that's the plan that he, he intends to follow so that he can know what the charges are and why everyone is so upset with him. But now listen, verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? A couple of things I think we ought to notice here. First of all, Paul did not hesitate to appeal to the law under which he lived for defense. And I'm talking about man's law. The law of Rome. Rome ruled the world at that time, or at least a good part of it. And so here is Paul, and what is he saying? He's saying, I'm a Roman, and I'm not condemned. Are you going to do this? Paul knows the law, and he appeals to it. It's not wrong for you and I to go into a courthouse and defend the gospel of Christ if it's being attacked, or defend the church of our Lord if it's being attacked using the very laws of the land. Paul did it. There wouldn't be anything wrong with you and I doing it if such a situation were to arise at some point in the future. But then secondly, observe that though Paul is ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus, he at least uh, wants to, to do all that he can to rectify his situation and prevent that death. And so he makes this appeal. Well, then verse 26, 
When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Well, now we know the commander's not even there. The commander has assigned a centurion to find out what's going on with Paul so that he will know what to do about this situation. The centurion, on hearing that Paul is a Roman, immediately goes to the commander and says, uh, you better be aware of what you're doing. You're about to get into a lot of trouble. Now listen to the very next verse, 27 of Acts 22. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. We might say, I was free born. And boy, there's quite a distinction there. This Roman soldier has paid a high price to, in order to get his Roman citizenship, but not Paul. Paul was born into that citizenship. And so the, the commander is going to have to treat him with respect. And that's what he does. Verse 29, Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also, was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Now you see, there's more to it than that. He really should not even have bound Paul. But he not only has bound him, he's just about had him beaten in order to find out what's going on. And so everybody's a little bit afraid here. They're, they're moved to, to be timid because of the situation which has gone well beyond anything that they might have imagined. So then in verse 30, uh, Luke reports this. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. So the commander still needs to know what the problem is. He has not understood the accusations made, probably because he didn't understand Hebrew. And so now he commanded, and that's of interest. The Roman authorities are in charge in Jerusalem. They, he commanded the Sanhedrin to assemble, and he's brought Paul right into their midst and puts him in front of them. They likely now are in a semicircle around him. He's standing in the middle ready to give his testimony, ready for the commander, at least, to learn what the real problem is. Paul has now arrived at Jerusalem. In some ways, he's gotten his fondest wish. He's ha having an opportunity to deliver the gospel to the Jews. They, of course, are not receptive when they realize the gospel is for all. But Paul is not deterred. He'll continue to tell the truth to one and all who will listen. May I reach heaven's joys, oh.